Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us, um, and welcome to the 2015 MagTug webinar series. Um, just a couple things about the the actual session itself. Um, you all the audience is muted, so if you have um, it, difficulty seeing or hearing anything, please feel free to use the chat dialog in your GoToWebinar uh, window. And questions we will take um, at the end of the webinar, and you can use your, your questions box in the, in the GoToWebinar uh, dialog box. Um, before we get started on the actual webinar, a couple things to remember. Uh, today is our last day for registration for the Spring Symposium, which is going to be held Thursday, March 5th at Villanova. And this is really to, to provide background on open source GIS applications and how they can be harnessed for transportation projects and how open data is important to both public, to the public we serve and transportation agencies within a region. Um, you can uh, learn more about this event at uh, magtug.wordpress.com and there's a link to register there. And again, today is the last day to do so. And while you're there, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our email list and to join our GIST uh, discussion group. A couple other things to note, we are running this, this webinar series on a regular basis. Uh, we pretty much do it bi-monthly. Uh, April, we have a scheduled presentation by Here Maps from Nokia. And they're going to explain how they uh, help correct and influence commercial digital road mapping with you know, consumer or our own data, if you will. In June, we will be showcasing advances in GIS education for transportation professionals. In August, we're planning on demonstrating disconnected editing uh, of GIS data in the field and how that's really come to be a, a powerful tool. In October, uh, really just in time for storm season, we're talking about how GIS can be used for disaster planning and damage, ass uh, damage assessment. In December, we have, uh, we're going to showcase cloud GIS and government services. Uh, we have that kind of lined up uh, for now. So now on to today's webinar. Um, it's titled... GIS-based management application support for snow removal operations. Uh, we have two presenters today. Uh, we have Simon Lewis of McMahon Associates, and we have Daryl St. Clair from PennDOT. So I will transfer the meeting over to Simon and let him uh, begin presenting. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for... Um uh, being there. I'm actually here with uh, Brian Vidal, who's the uh, Chief Information Officer um, of McMahon. Um, which, uh, this one? Uh, there we go. Uh, just a brief introduction to McMahon Associates, if, in case you don't know. We're a, a traffic engineering firm doing transportation planning, but also significant practice in infrastructure management. Um, this snow application um, comes under that rubric. Uh, we have offices up and down the East Coast. And we certainly work for um, a range of agencies, but a particular uh, focus is on our local agency um, support. Um, you can see the webinar brief here today. And originally, we were going to cover the whole hour. And this was going to be a dry run for a three-hour workshop we have at the AASHTO GIST Symposium, but uh, very, um, we're very grateful that, that Daryl Sinclair has agreed to join us from PennDOT, so we've been um, pleased to give up half of our time so we can both get a local perspective today and a, a state-level perspective on using GIS uh, for snow removal operations. So we'll try and cover a lot of the things here, but this will be a brief high-level coverage, and we're going to whip through some things um, fairly uh, quickly. But just a fun slide or two. You should always have a fun slide. Everyone likes to put a picture in of their alma mater. Well, there's my uh, alma mater at MIT with snow piled up in the last month. A big problem. We've escaped relatively likely in the Philadelphia area, but in Boston, they are dealing with this right now big time. And we're going to show you a Boston area application um, today where this is a very practical street level uh, issue. Of course, some people do have to go out and have fun, even if the mayor of Boston tells them not to. 
in skydiving out of windows and balconies um, has become quite a popular uh, sport up there right now. And Boston being a city of 66 universities, of course, people get very mathematical to try and calculate D. D is the distance, that, or the height of the snow, rather, that you need to dive into before you'll hit ground and uh, break some uh, limb or other appendage off your body. So, getting scientific about snow. At the local level, you would think, well, there's a lot of room for a lot of rubrics in terms of how we operate our trucks, our vehicles to go out and uh, um, m maximize their operation in terms of minimizing uh, salt rates, um, doing post-storm analysis to see which um, trucks or which contractors that were on the job were more efficient. However, doing use the needs assessments, and it's something I'm proud that um, McMahon does, you sometimes figure out what you think would be the key goal of the exercise. It can be a little bit different in emphasis or focus um, than it might otherwise be. And often when you go to speak to people and they say, well, you know, running an operation that's 10% more efficient, that's neat and nice. But the real number one issue is dealing with the public who are very concerned or angry if their street was not plowed. And if you can have a support system that demonstrates and quite clearly logs that you have been out in their street two, three, four times, um, it's a major advantage. So today, um, I. We'll cover a little bit both complex systems. I imagine the PennDOT system's a little more um, developed in, in, as a state level operation. But also, our focus will be at the local level and trying to deal with the basic questions that the public seem to deal with, which is, was my road swept? And if you're a manager, where are the vehicles and where is the vehicle that I need to go sweep that uh, street? In short, um, GIS is a natural platform for dealing with this sort of application. It's relatively new, though. Um, last few years, you've seen a few applications out there, uh, GIS-based, and we'll be showing you a couple of them um, today. In terms of pulling the data together, we will demonstrate that there are three types of data that you really need to pull together. One, the event data, that sort of performance that you're looking for, how often you need to um, go out and sweep the streets, the actual street level data, and then the vehicle data that you're going to go out and plow those streets with. So though we're focusing on applications today, uh, if we were going in more depth, we'd talk a little bit about the exercise you need to go through and assemble um, this, this data. But uh, just in short, you would set up the primary routes, which are plowed in all conditions, uh, secondary routes, which you might deal with in big storms. And if you're like we're going to be in the Boston area, um, they actually do go out and plow their uh, sidewalks and other public areas, a uh, thing I don't see quite so much here in uh, Philadelphia. They identify hot spots where typically they get a lot of complaints, a key driver for a lot of these applications. You then uh, need to uh, spatially enable or track all of the vehicles that are carrying out these activities. And we'll show you a little bit uh, how that um, works. If there's some trade-offs here in terms of how often you update the GPS signal you get from uh, the field. One point before shortly handing this over here that I just really um, want to emphasize is that you can do a standalone um, snow removal application, but at least at McMahon, we see the advantage of integrating this within a wider asset management um, system. So you're not sort of having to do uh, or deal with the dis issues of data integration, application integration. <coughs> So I'm now going to hand it to Brian Bedell, who's our chief uh, CIO, who's been intimately involved in putting our application uh, together. Okay, thanks, Simon. 
Um, Simon said we've, you know, we've developed this. What we're going to show you today is more focused on the standalone module, which is developed really over the last, I guess, six or seven years. We started with a custom solution and have built it to what is now a, a SaaS cloud-based solution that can, you know, really a multi-tenant solution, so multiple agencies can use the same program in general and access it from the cloud. So what we're going to do is just a real high-level overview of actually some past data. We're going to look at our, our testing environment and then jump into the live production environment for a minute to show you some up-to-date vehicle information. So what I'm going to do is just walk you around the overall functionality of the application in general, and then we'll dive into some details. This application is built on Esri's ArcGIS JavaScript platform, so we're heavily integrated with Esri. Uh, we also synchronize with ArcGIS Online, so any functionality such as, I heard the Collector app I think mentioned, or the, uh, their, their dashboard or their operations dashboard, we can actually synchronize and integrate with that functionality as well. We're not going to touch on any of that today, but what we will show is just some of the overall general functionality of this application. Uh, Newton did just this. We're going to should be showing Newton, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston. Obviously, this, this application has been heavily utilized by them this winter. Uh, they just launched it this winter, so it's been thoroughly tested uh, for really weeks at a time. It's been live operations really ongoing since, I think, January 26th when they had their first major blizzard, and we're going to be showing some of that storm today. So what you see up in front of you is just an overall mapping interface. You can see they have approximately 205 vehicles out. Um, the ones in red are basically not moving. The ones in green are currently active. And during a storm, these might all be green. They not only use their own local vehicles, their own, you know, the, the trucks from their public works departments, but they also have eight separate groups of contractors, which they track during a storm as well. And that was one of the key points for them was, Simon mentioned the hot spots and the spots that generally don't get hit. Well, they wanted to make sure that the contractors were actually hitting their spots and were in their zones and, and doing the work they were supposed to be doing. I'm going to show you a little bit about how some of that works. So general application, it's just like everyone I'm sure on this call is familiar with GIS. We have all of your standard panning and zooming um, functionality. We have a kind of a locate me feature because this is a, a mobile-based application as well. It uh, works on tablets as well as smartphones. So this is just a web interface, but you do get full functionality on a tablet. I'm just going to walk through some of the basic functionality again. We have your standard base maps through ArcGIS Online. We also integrate with Bing as well as Google Maps just to give an overview of maybe where things are and be able to view satellite imagery as you're in here tracking your plows and tracking the storm. So I'm just going to start kind of showing you, I guess we talked about the vehicles. You can see this bottom grid down here. All vehicles are filterable. Um, you can search locate specific vehicles by vehicle name. That's really how they track them within a storm. You can view the history of a vehicle, which I'll touch on a little more. So you can kind of view a, a breadcrumb trail of a specific time period if you weren't sure if a vehicle was where it was supposed to be. That's generally enabled in all fleet applications, but it's nice to have it integrated with the snow information as well. The vehicles and how the application really functions is we have, we have all vehicles within the application assigned to a specific group. So at the beginning of a, a season, you can see they have all their contractors in their various yards. And within each of these groups, they have the specific vehicle numbers assigned to that group. And now what the purpose of that and what that does is if we see we can actually check the various zones that each group is assigned to through GIS. So looking here, we have contractor one is actually assigned to this green area, contractor two to the blue area. And within that, within those specific larger zones, we also have smaller zones, um, which the secondary routes are contained within. So during a storm, and again, how this application works is specific vehicles are assigned to specific groups, and then those specific groups are assigned to specific zones. So they're only going to mark streets as plowed if they're within that specific zone during that specific storm event period. and how storm, I guess, is, is really built and how we manage the event data. This is the current running storm that we just started yesterday for the purposes of this test. So we don't see a lot of green. Um, really what the application does is it will turn certain street segments and certain zones green once they've actually been completed. I just brought that up on the map here. Again, this is a, a test storm, not a live situation, but this is live data since yesterday. So you'll actually see vehicles moving around on the map. And basically what it does, if they drive over it and they're assigned to that zone, the street gets marked as plowed. Um, 
Now, when that streak gets marked as plowed, we track every single pass that goes over it. So every time a specific vehicle hits a segment, it marks it as plowed, and that's the way Newton had it, wanted it set up. We've had other clients who are actually tracking if the plow was up plow or, or the plow was down. They didn't want to get into that because with the contract vehicles, the contract vehicles are actually using mobile devices, and with mobile GPS devices, you can't hook into the actual plow itself to see if it's up or down. So that's why we come up with a solution to assign the plow or the truck to specific zones. Again, you might get some missed marks where someone drove down a street with the plow up, but that wasn't their concern for this season. So again, we're not actually tracking plow up or plow down within their context. But with other types of uh, clients, we certainly could, and that's built into the application and it's configurable. I just want to show you how storms actually generated. So as Simon mentioned, you do track the actual event types and operation names, how much precipitation is expected to fall, how much precipita precipitation did fall. We won't get on to the analytics and reporting in this, in this uh, webinar today, but for follow-up data and analyzing data, past data, you'll, you'll have this information tracked along with it. One of the things I just wanted to mention on this screen is uh, this past reset interval. So as trucks are, are driving around plowing things, if you have a, a large event, you're obviously going to need to hit roads more than once. This past, inter this past reset interval, which you can set you know, on your own every two, three, or four hours, I think Newton generally during these storms was setting it every four hours, if a road's been hit once and it turns green, four hours later, if you have this set, it'll turn back to orange and basically let you know that it needs to be plowed again. So it's just a little bit, you know, it, it allows them to not just see everything turning green during the event of a storm and knowing that it's plowed, because really what they're doing during an event is looking at this map and seeing what's been done and what hasn't. And the green and orange clearly lets them see what, what needs to be done. After an event, what they can do is go and see exactly when things were hit. I know a recent instance, the mayor walked in and he had a, a resident complaining and the public works commissioner was able to immediately show the mayor by clicking, going down to a specific street segment, clicking on that segment, and clicking view history, he can actually see when that road was complete. And again, this will track as many passes as, as that have been done on that specific segment. So the things that they are tracking, I've talked a little about the Simon talked about the mains or the primary routes, they call them mains. Then we also have the secondary routes. And then we have sidewalks, um, hot spots, which they have classified into specific streets and sidewalks. We can see when they've been done. You can see here that actually none of the hot spots have been done. So again, we just started the storm yesterday. I'll show you a previous event where you know that all the roads actually were complete. And then they also track hand crew areas as well. So and that's how they track that is just they have to park the vehicle in the specific hand crew area and then once it leaves, it marks it as complete. What I'm going to do now is actually just show you a, a previous storm. So not only can we, you know, after a storm has ended, we can go in and view a previous event just by going to this operations tab. We can see all of the operations that have been done. Again, this is the test server. So these, this 2015 blizzard was the first one, and we ran it simultaneously with their production server so that we do have some actual data in this staging environment. And what we can do is we can view the execution of that, or we can view it on a map. Now, what the execution means is not only can we view these things on a map and allow the trucks to automatically update what's going on on the screen in real time, we can also manually set things and manually update. So not only can we view the data on a map, but now we have, you can see, I'm on main, so this is their primary routes. You can see these, these are all the specific route numbers, 1 through 7, 1 through 19. And within each of these, we actually have every segment within them. And what time those were completed, and what time they were done during a previous event. During a live event, you can manually update these things. If for some reason the GPS data wasn't there and you need to override something, you can actually go in or a commissioner or a manager can go in or staff can view this information and update it in real time and it will update the map as well. But again, you can quickly go in here and see, okay, well, Route 2 wasn't complete. What was missed? And you can scroll down and view, okay, it was Tremont Street. For some reason, this didn't get hit. So they can, you know, that's, that's why this, top level is orange and not green because everything below it was not complete. And the same goes for our secondary zones and sidewalks, our hot spots, and everything else within it. Just one thing to note, we're only tracking plowing here, but this application has also been used by them to track. They, they actually sand up there instead of really salting. They do some salting, but they do a lot of sanding, as well as you know if you're doing brining or anything else. It, it all depends on how it's configured, but it can be configured to track various types of things. And, 
people even use it year round for things like you know garbage collection or just street sweeping, cleaning, and those sorts of things as well. Because it's really just GPS data integration with your GIS you know, street data or route data that you might have. One other thing I wanted to touch on on this screen is during an event, um, you also have we also have various dashboards that we can see. So a manager can walk in and if the public works commissioner comes in and asks the staff where they're at, where they're currently at, now they can, can they view it on a map or view it on that execution screen as I just showed you in, in various levels of detail, but they can also view percentage complete by route type. So we can see the mains for this form are 99.2% complete, so they might have actually missed one or two things. Uh, but again, this is updated by that pass, that plow pass interval as well, so if that pass interval is running and things need to be hit again, these percentages are going to go back down. Then we can also see which elements are done uh, by various time levels. This is just current data and how many segments are currently being hit by each particular group. And then lastly, I just want to show you two other items. So this is actual live vehicle data um, coming in right now. We can see it's up to date up to 1022. This is live data. The other one's almost live, but we have it set a little bit behind for testing, various testing purposes. But what you can do during an event or after an event is track where vehicles have been at specific times. So if because we, they, they'll go get calls and say someone is not in the location they may, they're supposed to be or a contractor is not in his zone, just various other items. Um, they can already have this set up, but you can pick a specific date and time and view the history of a specific vehicle and then show those on a map to see exactly where he went. So you can see that's just through the past hour of this morning. This was actually 8.30, what this vehicle was doing. So you can go to any point in time, you know, in the past or, you know, really during, during a current storm or during a previous storm and view exactly when and where a specific vehicle was. So again, that's very useful, you know, for making sure your contractors or your guys aren't, you know, sitting at Dunkin' Donuts or at a coffee shop rather than being out plowing. And then... on the maintenance facility. And you can also see where the various trucks are. It's time to just mention you know, there's the various maintenance facilities. So Newton has two and you can really see, you know, when, when trucks are really bunched up uh, and some of these are moving and some of them aren't probably getting ready to go out. But they have two maintenance facilities within within the city. Um, that's actually their more or less their southern one. They're both responsible for different zones in the city, obviously just like the contractors are. They're their public works staff is responsible for all the primaries, but one is really north of this I-90 I west and the other one is south. And then one final thing I'll talk about with the vehicles is uh, the ability to locate a vehicle closest to an address or an area on the map. And this can be useful during, especially during an event. If you have an emergency type of situation, someone needs to get to a hospital or you have a hot spot that maybe hasn't been cleared, we have the ability to quickly locate the closest actual three vehicles to a specific location, just by clicking on a map, it'll draw and let me know which ones basically are closest and actually give you directions. Uh, so again, there's there's a lot to show. That's really, you know, the high-level overview of, I think, everything. Simon, did you want to add anything to? No, we, we kind of rushed through that um, fairly fast. Um, because we want to make sure uh, Daryl's got equivalent time, but uh, we've got 15 minutes at the end, right, Bob, for uh, for questions and comments. Correct. Yes. We, if there's any uh, specific questions related to what um, okay. Simon and Brian just showed you, we can we can certainly take uh, some time at the end. Good. Well, that's our. I guess just one last point I'd like to make with the, this this particular application is, you know, we one of the problems, I guess, or that we had, we had developed a previous application for another city or township, and they were really tracking by zones. Um, the city of Newton wanted to get down to the segment level, so we could see street segments of the particular blocks. And what we had to do to kind of facilitate that was find GPS vendors that had five or ten second updates, and noting that they have, so we have five or ten second updates, so we can actually hit the specific segments. And then we have algorithms that track which direction they're going and a bunch of other things going on and spatially that allows us to track you know, which specific segments were hit and when they were hit. But the other, I guess, issue we had with that that we had to overcome was the amount of data we had to process. If there's you know, 200 trucks giving us data every 10 seconds, um, that's, a, that's a lot of data to process every minute. So if we have 
10 seconds of data times 200 trucks, you, know, you can just imagine the millions of records that actually come out of each event that we have to process and maintain uh, within the application and on our servers. So it was an issue we had to overcome this summer, but we certainly did, and it's been um, got tested pretty well with the events that they've had up there this year, and it's been a, a very useful tool for them. Uh, not that there's not some tweaks that they're probably not going to make after this season's over, but again, it's been a useful tool and, and worked out well for them during this uh, pretty painful winter season. And maybe one other point that was very implicit in what we showed here, that this is a fully web-enabled application that will work on your favorite flavor of uh, browser and can be taken out in the field. Um, does help to have a device with adequate screen resolution, but um, uh, can be used wherever you can gain uh, reasonable internet access. That's us, I think, um, um, uh, Bob. Um, thank you. So we pass to uh, uh, Daryl? Yes, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Daryl Sinclair from PennDOT. And just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions at any point, just we, you can type them into the, the questions bar and, and we'll, we'll tackle them at the end. So, Daryl, you should be prompted to show your screen. All right, can you see the screen? <clears throat> Simon, can you see the screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right, great. Day. Uh, uh, good morning, and uh, um, uh, thank you for having me on here. Um, so, my name is Daryl Sinclair. Uh, I am one of the business leads, uh, if you will, on a, a software solution that a consultant, GeoDecisions, built for us. Um, so myself, uh, I work in the central office, uh, Bureau of Maintenance Operations for PennDOT, and uh, co-business leads. We had Sandy Tosca, who's a district executive in one of our district offices, and Joe Tosca, who also works in that district. Uh, we were the main business leads to help uh, build this uh, software, and I'll, I'll show you the benefits of the software here uh, shortly. We also had input from the district's uh, other district offices as we were building the software. Um, so I'm not, what I was getting at is I'm not uh, an IT person, uh, so if you've asked questions on what software platforms, et cetera, this is built on, that's not me. I'm more of the technical uh, business lead. Okay, so just trying to show the importance of what this software tool can do uh, of the data that you could pull out of it. So last year, uh, PennDOT spent $250 million on winter, and that doesn't even include fuel. And we used 1.2 million tons of salt. You know, say 70 bucks a ton. That's 100 million tons just in salt alone. Uh, and we have 2,400 uh, department trucks and uh, a couple hundred rental trucks and, and de-icing trucks. So that's that's big bucks out there. Uh, of uh, if you could optimize or save just 10% of uh, th those costs, that's huge money that you could save. Um, so we have a, a maintenance budget, uh, which is $1.3 billion, and then we also have a capital program where we do construction projects that was $1.3 uh, billion also. Um, now, you may have heard PennDOT, uh, Pennsylvania, got a funding increase. So that money went towards new construction projects. Uh, that money did not go to pay electric bills in county maintenance offices or to give county maintenance offices uh, pay raises or to help uh, the, the funding of, of those maintenance op offices. Uh, it's not to say that some of that funding that we got can't be used to help pave some roads, which ultimately helps those uh, uh, counties out. Um, but what I'm what I'm getting at is that 1.3 billion. Um, we ha we actually have some counties who are broke who could barely afford to pay the electric bill, so we need to find ways of saving money out of those county budgets uh, to become. Uh, more efficient and cost effective just because inflation keeps on uh, e eating away at our budget. So I'm going to present to you a bunch of different data sources on ways that we could uh, save money. Historically, PennDOT's been a decentralized uh, agency. We had uh, 11, we have 11 districts. Over the past couple years, uh, uh, especially emphasized by our previous secretary, uh, Barry Shoke, um, and, the, and the effort's going to continue with our new secretary. We're moving towards a, more of a uh, centralized or at least a regionalization approach and, and resource sharing am amongst our districts as opposed to uh, 
a decentralized approach with every district managing uh, themselves as, the, uh, as it was in the past. Um, so why did, again, here's some more reasons on why we built this application. Um, so this is a, a static tool um, on, on purpose. We also have a, an, we're in the first year of a new AVL solution, so we also have the ability to track 100 trucks and, and where they go, but that's not the purpose of this tool. This tool is a planning operation, and we picked one type of storm, which is most common to PennDOT, and that's a 25 degree and rising spreading storm. That's mostly uh, uh, the, the type of storm we get here in Pennsylvania, and you want every county to plan for the same uh, type of storm. So um, each truck driver, you know, they, they need a, a map uh, at the beginning of the year to show what routes they're plowing and, uh, you know, one, just so they know what routes are plan, uh, plowing. And obviously, obviously you have sick leave and, and trucks go to uh, help uh, other trucks. So you need maps and all these trucks of what the route is. Um, so this software solution is a automated way of producing maps uh, in the old days. And I was an intern in the 90s. And uh, we used to highlight on maps where each uh, truck went. Now it's built into a solution. And you could hit a button, and you get maps printed out of where all the, tr the trucks are going. Um, we are also looking into a, a dynamic routing application that uh, um, would optimize the routes, like a UPS type uh, software solution. Um, we, ha we had did pilot a uh, software solution from Indiana. Um, also part of a winter Ashto group with Clear Roads, where we uh, hired a consultant to tell us uh, some solutions uh, uh, with other states as far as what all solutions are out there as far as optimizing routes. But this is a static solution. This slide here is just uh, a slide on uh, the reporting structure within PennDOT. So we have a uh, central office, which I'm in, and we have 11 engineering districts, and then there's 67 counties beneath those engineering districts. Um, so some savings that we realized, you know, again, automating maps, you know, that you just hit a button. And you don't have to keep on drawing and tracing maps every year whenever your routes change. Um, once you get the data out of the system, we, we have uh, municipal agreements where uh, municipalities plow our routes for us, and we would pay them based upon how many miles that uh, they, they uh, maintain for us. And the data from this application showed that um, we were inconsistent, and we were able to reconcile those agreements to make sure that they were getting paid for all the routes that they were actually driving before it was just a, a manual effort. So this uh, provides checks and balances. Um, also allows uh, neighboring counties to see uh, from county to county what uh, routes are being plowed and how often. I'll, I'll get into uh, some more of that here. Um, so here's an example uh, screenshot, and I'm actually going to go uh, to the actual software solution right now and just show you some screens. So this is the home screen. Um, so what you do is uh, you could enter agreements. So if you have a contractor plowing a route for you, you enter that here. Um, if you have a municipal agreement with a municipality plowing route for you, you enter that here. Agility means um, a municipality typically is plowing a route in exchange for, for services. So maybe a municipality plows the snow for summer time, and we still cut a road for them in the summertime. So that's the difference between agility and municipal. Um, so all that data is uh, entered into this uh, software solution. We have a lot of checks and balances built into this, um, such as vet vendors are preloaded into the system from other data sets, all of our routes and widths are loaded into this system from other data sets. All of our equipment is loaded into this uh, system uh, software solution um, from our SAP system. So uh, you can't, it's hard to enter that data. We have checks and balances built in. Under this screen here is where you uh, enter your, your truck information, whether it's a department force or a routed rental. Uh, you tell it a sign of a stock pal. Um, and various other, you sign the plow and the spreader uh, information down here. And you sign the route that it plows down here at the, at the bottom of the screen. Back 
back up to the top. Okay, the snow routes tab here is more of a search function where you could uh, look at a, a given uh, route and uh, see what trucks are assigned to that route, or it could be a stock power, it could be a, a state route. Um, so that's a, more of a, a search function. And you have the user management and domain management, so you could assign users to the system. Uh, domain management is, let's say you get different types of uh, uh, brine uh, additives. Um, you have uh, during, uh, new ones are being uh, manufactured uh, yearly, so you have the ability to add different uh, types of uh, salt brine additives uh, to, to it, so it's a forever growing uh, uh, system. Um, we have some built, oops, sorry. We have some built-in reports here, right in the software solution alone. So you could run a report that shows how many miles each district is plowing, for example. Um, you could run a report that shows um, was there any gaps or overlaps uh, with, with somebody, with two trucks plowing the same route. So you could run a report and find out if that is occurring. Um, one of the inputs that you're required to entry, uh, enter for each truck is what is its cycle time. Um, so that's another, and, and, how, and then obviously the system will calculate how many miles it's plowing. So that's another report that you could run that's built into the system. Um, how many trucks uh, are assigned uh, per uh, county and per stockpile, you could run a report on that. And then equipment that's not assigned. So we have uh, an equipment inventory out of our SAP system uh, that has all, every piece of equipment that, that uh, is in our inventory. And then each truck, each each truck in the system is required to put enter you know the, the plow and the spreader that's assigned to it. So then you could run a report that says, all right, what equipment is not being used in our inventory, um, and and run a report of that. So that way you know, hey, do you have a bunch of plows sitting at a stockpile that we could uh, sell off that aren't being used, and um, we could uh, generate some funds over that. So it's a pretty powerful tool. So these are just general reports that are built right into the system. We have uh, at least 20 or 20 to 40 different reports that we run through a, a crystal report. So I believe it's now called business objects, where you could uh, run different reports to pull data out of the system. Um, but we're, we're handing the, the remainder of those reports outside of the software solution. Um, and to go to this uh, tab here, you could print out a map out of uh, for each county. Uh, uh, just by clicking on the screen here. Now you also have the ability to go to your GIS expert in the district and they could print out big big maps and, and overlay that GIS data with other GIS data uh, as well. But everybody, every operator or assistant man manager or foreman can go on their computer screen here and, and just print out a map to put in their truck at the click of a button. Um, so just a quick demo of what the software solution looks like. Let me come back to the PowerPoint here. Um, so again, we uh, built this solution to analyze our, our truck fleet. Um, in particular, each county is to have a certain uh, truck uh, allocation that they're allowed. Now that information hasn't been um, updated in years. Uh, in particular, it was always a self-reporting in the past. So let's say you were able to get more municipalities to sign on to do business with you, um, but there was it was but those districts may have never given up the department force trucks or kept them uh, that used to carry those routes. They still have them in their fleet. Um, I'm just giving you an example of uh, that we're not. And every county is not consistent on the number of trucks that they have per mile from county to county across the state because we were decentralized. So this is just our, our formula. It's pretty complex here, but I just wanted to show you a, a snapshot of it. This is a formula that we call uh, MISI, Maintenance Efficiency, Efficiency Cost Effectiveness, um, and it shows uh, how many trucks. The current truck fleet here comes from the snow route application I just showed you and it compares it to an equation of how many trucks you're supposed to have. So this particular county, Crawford, um, is within, within its number uh, uh, current truck fleet. They're allowed to have 43 trucks, and they have 38, so uh, they're 
uh, doing pretty good there. So that's just an example of our equation, Pendot's equation on uh, how many trucks you're allowed to have. Okay, so the data, this is example reports that uh, come out of the software tool. So um, this one here is um, cycle time. So this shows you how many trucks have a cycle time less than two hours or uh, and all those thresholds there. So maybe you go to that first column there that's uh, highlighted in red, and that can be maybe low-hanging fruit on uh, can you uh, decrease the number of your trucks you have uh, if you're providing a, a real high level of service. Maybe you don't want to provide that high level of service and you didn't, didn't realize it. So it's just uh, uh, providing you data uh, to, to show where you're at. Here's another one as far as how many miles are on the truck. So uh, we have 174 trucks that are plowing less than 20 miles. So again, perhaps low-hanging fruit of uh, uh, if we wanted to reduce our truck fleet, uh, maybe you could you could start there. Or it helps uh, combining this with GIS maps as far as maybe you could extend routes to routes from other trucks uh, and uh, reduce a, a truck in the fleet. So again, it's just providing you data on where you could look. Uh, obviously, a GIS uh, base, so it provides maps of uh, all these thresholds. So this map here is showing um, all those trucks uh, uh, in a given area of and how many miles that they're plowing. So, um, for example, uh, we don't typically cross uh, county lines from one district to another district. So now we have the ability to go from one district to the next district, the adjacent county. Perhaps they ha they have uh, uh, one truck with 10 miles on it, uh, and the neighboring county over has one truck with 10 miles on it with the same uh, uh, on the same route, but they're just in different counties. So now we have the ability to say, hey, maybe uh, through transparency here, we can become more efficient, and those trucks can uh, combine their routes. Um, so it's just, again, pulling out the, the data from the system, uh, putting it into a JS-based uh, solution so it's easier to uh, understand and an analyze the data. Uh, here's another report. Uh, this just shows how many miles by uh, category that are being plowed. Um, so in, in PennDOT, we have we plow 95,000. Uh, we're responsible for plowing and maintaining 95,000 snow lane miles. We have about 40,000 linear miles of road, but if you count the multiple lanes, it goes up to 95,000 snow lane miles. And this is just a breakdown by our what we call business plan network. Um, in case you wanted to provide different levels of service, uh, obviously interstates are going to provide a higher level of service. So um, we built into this solution um, the ability to analyze routes by uh, the ADT, the traffic, and, and its network. Um, so we have over 200 trucks um, that are that we have so. Analyzing this data, we found out that you know, there's, there was 200 trucks in the system that were not assigned a route. So at a replacement, uh, the, trucks, I mean, the, the slide says 150, but probably a, a new truck is more close to 175, $200,000 now. So that's uh, big bucks to be saved if you, we were willing to reduce the fleet size. Um, obviously. Uh, it all depends on how reliable your fleet is. So some districts um, like to keep more spares than others um, as, as backups in case trucks go down. Um, so that's all. That's what you have to manage whenever making a decision. So if you want to reduce the fleet, you got to make sure you have to have a reliable fleet to back it up. But that's uh, 200 trucks is what we uh, have to to work with here. It could potentially uh, be reduced. Um, in particular, four of the 11 districts uh, have 82 uh, of those trucks. Um, or, or four, they, they, that, that calculation, that formula I showed you previously, there's four districts that have more trucks than what they were, if every district was to be consistent with the number of miles they had on per truck and using that formula, um, you could reduce uh, 82 trucks if you calculated it that way. Um, additional ways uh, the ability to save money. Um, so you, 
again, you could uh, this anybody can go on this, their their desk as a PennDOT account um, and run reports with drill downs. Um, uh, provides maps uh, at your desk, or you can print them out. Uh, the anomalies from uh, district to district uh, uh, be became evident, um, such as maybe if you're driving across Route 80, one district would service it at every 45 minutes, and another district would service it every two hours. So this is one example. Or one district would anti-ice uh, route, uh, and then whenever you get to the next district over, maybe the next district wouldn't anti-ice. So this uh, was able to pull out data. You could see that stuff uh, pretty easily. Um, again, uh, ability to provide gaps and, and overlaps if, some, if we were put on the same route twice. We also could run reports on what districts are plowing routes or what counties are plowing routes in, in other counties. Uh, to, to track how much we're helping other counties out. Um, so potential savings in year one were so we didn't implement anything yet. We just got this data. We just made sure it was accurate this past winter. And now each district, as opposed to central office dictating how many trucks you would reduce or or other ways uh, or saying how many plows you had to get rid of. Our approach is allow the districts and the counties to pick what they want to do to save money. So we're, we call this uh, county modernization, and it's a new uh, program that's being started. And uh, we actually have a, a kickoff meeting with our Chester County. Uh, they're going to be the first one to go through county modernization. That's here this Thursday. Um, in particular, they don't uh, they don't want to reduce their department force fleet, but they were willing to reduce their rental fleet. They found out through this data that they have um, 40 more rental trucks on average than what other districts have or other counties have for equal miles and traffic. So they are going to use this data uh, to see what routes uh, can be combined. Um, and so that way we could reduce our, our rental fleet and maybe do those, those routes in-house. So it's just one example of uh, ways to save money. Another district may pick, they, they may say, hey, we have 20 trucks as backups and every other district has five trucks as backups. So they may say, all right, we're going to get rid of uh, five uh, department force trucks. So that district may choose to go that direction. Another district may say, hey, we have uh, 20 extra plows sitting that we don't need. So we may be able to save money going that way. But each county and district is uh, allowed to pick. Uh, we'll give them some dollar targets on where they need to go in order to make sure that they maintain their budgets. But uh, it's going to be driven at the uh, local level as far as what solutions they want to do to save the money. So these, the 1.5 to 2.4 million in savings, that was estimates from we, we do business plans annually, and the districts reported to us what uh, solutions they wanted to do in winter to save money. And those were the estimates that would come out of that. So we hope to perhaps implement some of those solutions headed into next winter. And uh, that's uh, all I got. Um, if you have questions, you could email me, or you could uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to uh, to Bob and you can ask questions away. Thanks, Daryl. Um, certainly a topic that's near and dear to everyone's heart, given uh, the last couple of winters we had in this region. So there are a few questions that I'll start running through, um, Daryl. And I think you kind of touched on this one a little bit, but. It's kind of in the context of what operational differences between the districts might have presented challenges when building the solution. And I know you mentioned de-icing rates or, or intervals and things like that, but I, I don't know if you had anything else to add to that. It's every, every category of every piece of data that we tracked in here, you could find an anomaly from one county to another county. So we weren't, uh, sometimes we, we we weren't standard on consistent on anti-icing. We weren't standard and consistent on levels of service as far as how uh, often you would hit a route. We weren't. We we're not consistent as far as how many trucks each county has, um, or, or in, in spare trucks. So it's it's a combination of all that. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question here is the planning software uses formulas and rules to allocate the fleet. Is there any reporting feedback from the districts to validate the formulas that the formulas and the rules are valid? 
Yeah, um, the, the formula was actually built uh, over 10 years ago, and I, I was told, um, I worked in the district office at that time in design, but I was told that we reduced our fleet um, by 100 trucks maybe 10 years ago, but um, the, the equations are now, it's more valid because you self-reported in the past as far as how many miles were plowed by municipal and rental, where now as opposed to we have software solutions that uh, it's not self-reporting, we know that actual data. Um, the only disparity uh, or controversy, for lack of a better word, is uh, in urban situations, how many do we have the exact formula for how many trucks you need uh, in urban areas. Um, so right now we have a breakdown between urban and rural, but they perhaps should there be an urban one and an urban two, should, should Philadelphia be allowed to have more trucks than Harrisburg or Pittsburgh, for example. So that's uh, the only area where maybe not everybody would, would see eye to eye, but we're, we're verifying uh, our formula through time studies. We've, we've done time studies in the past where we put people in trucks to figure out what uh, are their actual cycle times. Um, and now through our new uh, AVL solution, we have AVL in 100 trucks. Um, and we're using the, the solution that, I forget what it's called, but we're the one that Iowa DOT is, is using. Now we're able to verify those time studies just by clicking a button because you have that a software solution to do it instead of putting somebody in the truck with a time watch. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question that's come across, and Simon, this one's actually for you. Um, you mentioned that you could use your favorite flavor of mobile device in, in the application that you demonstrated, and um, you know some folks have a Windows phone, and they can simply use IE on the phone to access any web page. Um, you know, Flash is often not supported on the on the Flash is usually not supported on a Windows browser. Have you used this application successfully on the three main mobile phones, iPhone, Android, and Windows? I can answer that for you. Um, there's multiple ways to access it. Actually, one way is I, I talked a little bit. This is Brian. Sorry. I talked a little bit about the, the synchronization with ArcGIS Online. You can actually send this data out and view it on ArcGIS's mobile apps. Is one way to view them. On tablets, if you want to view the data right now, um, it is supported across all major browsers. The full functionality of the application is not supported on a phone. You can view certain amounts of data, but it is there is no Flash involved at all. It's actually all HTML5 and JavaScript, so it is supported across all major new browsers. Um, we do plan on launching an, a, a native application of our own for additional functionality this year. Uh, throughout the summer, we're, we're, we're going to be working on that. So again, I guess the simple answer is, not all functionality is supported across all phones right now, but we, you can view some pieces of data through certain native apps as well as some web apps. But again, um, it is supported through all major browsers. Okay. Great. Well, that looks like, um, I don't know if anyone has any last-minute questions, you can certainly send them over, but it looks like we've gotten through the questions and the presentations in just under an hour, which is kind of what we were hoping can, for. Can I ask a question then? Sure. Mr. Darrell. Um, so I've, I was interested in uh, Simon's presentation. Um, two questions. Um, how do you define an event in particular? Is an event the 24-hour period or is an event, um, let's say a snowstorm spans over two days? Um, how do you define an event whenever you're generating reports? An event can be defined, actually, that's up to the agency. Generally, though, what we have you know, seen the, the agencies that we've worked with currently do is they define an event as the entire plowing or salting process from the time you start until the time you finish. Um, again, that pass interval will allow you to reset if an event's going on for a long time. You can really you know, know that you have to hit something again, but an event is defined. Generally, again, it's up, it's up to the agency, but um, we've seen mostly that the event's defined from start to finish. So, it could so be, do they sign like an event ID? Yep. Um, so, so you tie two, two days together under one event? Yeah, it's, well, it's really, it's really just one event when you start it. And then basically how it's, you know, we didn't run through that process today. But you start an event when you begin. And then, you know, you enter that information about the event, which will assign it an ID as well as the date and description. And then at the end of the event, when you're done, you basically just click end event. And then it saves all that information that, you know, all that data that's associated with that multiple day plowing period. Like I think Newton, one, one of the events they had up there this year, they were plowing for, you know, over 96 hours straight. And that was one main event. Um, again, they kept it all together. So each 
profile operator would uh, enter something on a computer screen then to show what routes they plowed, then so that's how. Well, you actually, they the, the plow data. operators don't have to do anything but drive the GPS device. You know, once you've started that event, um, it's only really the, the supervisors and staff that, that enter any information. Um, you, <laughs> we've worked on a couple pilot projects where plow drivers can actually update stuff manually via phone uh, or a tablet if they if they wanted to. But what the application does is it updates automatically based on the GPS information. So the plow operator actually doesn't have to do anything. Um, okay. so once the event started, there's basically there's there's different plans that can be put in place for each storm about you know which routes are going to be done by which drivers and which groups of drivers. So if you have a, a small event, you're just doing your primary roads, you could actually select that particular event type that we're just doing our primaries. But when it's a major storm, the events are all, you know, the plans, the storm plans are built before the season starts. I know it's like some of you said some of your routes may change. So all those routes and all of the planning and, and everything that goes into that is programmed into the GIS data within the application. So those events are kind of predefined before the season starts. They can be manipulated during a season and trucks can be reassigned to different routes during an event or before a specific event. But generally all of that is, is pre-planned and we import that data into our application with all the routes and the priorities and everything else that goes along with that is all saved within the application. So that again, you know, we try to make sure all that the drivers really have to do is, is drive the truck and the GPS device itself will update the application for them. Okay, that was my second question. So uh, as on the, the software that I just demoed, that's this is what you're you're going to hit whenever you you go out as your as your first cycle. However, maybe one truck has to go help out another truck on and take care of the interstate because you want to make that be a higher priority. So is your is the tool dynamic enough then to be able to go and, and track on the fly if one truck went off of his route and helped out another truck? Yes, and you can if you if you want him to if if you're managing the operation, it'll know he was there. And if he wasn't assigned to that specific route, it wouldn't necessarily say that he had plowed it. That's the way we have it set up right now. But during midstorm, you can just take that truck, assign him to that group or to that route, and then it would know that it did it. So you can definitely do that, you know, during an event. What you know on the fly, you can make that change um, to assign him to that specific area, so you'll know where he was. But vice versa, you can also see where he was and. He wasn't assigned again. Right now, we have it set up so that if they are assigned, it it will hit that. But if you didn't want to work it that way, more or less, you could have all trucks assigned to all groups, and you would, you know, that's just that's up to the agency again um, to decide if how they want their plan to be set up. If they want it set up so that only specific trucks can hit specific areas, or if they want it set up so all can hit other areas. Or again, if it is only hitting specific areas, you can reassign a mid-event, and then it'll it, it can track them that way. Great, thanks. That's all I had. Okay. Well, once again, just um, thanks everyone for attending today. I'd certainly like to thank Daryl Sinclair from PennDOT and, and Simon and Brian from um, McMahon for taking the time out to present. And um, just as a reminder, uh, feel free to check us out on our website, magtug.wordpress.com. Uh, sign up for the upcoming uh, open source discussion on at Villanova and uh, future webinars. So. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. All right, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.